Okay. Art, check. Math, check. Psychology, next week. History, I'll put off. Looks like tonight is the final for Doctor Who, and I hope I've studied enough between standing cat naps. Welcome, ghosts, dead men, and zombie Clara to the 136th, uh, 136th episode of an unearthly podcast. Streaming live on the 9th of December, 2015, and featuring Hellbent, written by Stephen Moffat. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. I have candy canes. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Always a pleasure. Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. Ice cream! And Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Cumulus! And you'd better be sharing that ice cream because I haven't <laughs> had any in ages because I have not been the one shopping. <laughs> well, you see, you need to live in, you need to move to Wisconsin, Bill. We're the frickin' dairy state of the of, of the country. Ice cream and frozen custard is everywhere well, around Well, the thing here. is, when I do the shopping, mm -hmm. ice cream does not, we do not stop having ice cream in the freezer. But I have not been doing the shopping. Um, ice cream has been pretty rare in this household recently, other than Aaron's uh, chocolate shake from McDonald's. That I put in the freezer and refreeze? Because normally uh -huh. we'll just go out and it's like, hey, you feel like ice cream? Let's go to Michael's Frozen Custard or let's go to Culver's. Or let's go to Dairy Queen. You know, we'll just do that kind of thing. I have yeah. Superman ice cream down the freezer. Oh, I God! It yet. Ah. It's delicious. It's horrible. It is no, the only not. ice cream in the world that actually tastes like blue, red, and yellow. It's delicious. <laughs> so, I'm not sure if this is my fault or Aaron's fault, but let's <laughs> move on from Both. this topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, we'll move start along. with, we'll move start with our news. As usual, there were a lot of birthdays um, this past week. I picked the top four uh, birthdays to say happy birthday to, uh, all of which, by the way, are not posthumous. Yay. Hmm. Uh, number one, uh, happy birthday to Noel Clark, who, of course, uh, New Who fans will remember as Mickey Smith. Noel Clark turned 40 on December 6th, a feat that I have to deal with uh, coming up here shortly. <laughs> Other than being Mickey Smith, um, some might remember him from a uh, role in uh, Star Trek Into Darkness where he played Thomas Harewood, um, the man who blew up a good chunk of uh, Starfleet headquarters. He uh, also appear appeared in Big Finish's Dalek Empire, but I'm pretty sure it was not Mickey. I'm pretty sure. it hmm. uh, Was that before new who i think it was 2006 so but they obviously did not have the new who license yeah um more recently he has been in the role of detective inspector prior in the tv miniseries chasing shadows and has the role of eric in the throwaways both this year happy birthday noel clark yes moving on uh we have a happy birthday to wendy padbury who played mm. Zoe Harriet back in the Second Doctor era? Mm. Wendy turned 68 uh, on uh, Monday, December 7th. <clears throat> Zoe is only 28 years older than Mickey. Well, it's weird because it, I realized that that meant that he was 2930 when he was doing the role of Mickey Smith, and he didn't look at that. No, no he did not. He's got a very young looking. So he still yeah. doesn't look that old. And um, Wendy Padbury was actually pretty young when she was doing the role of Zoe. I don't think she was teenager, but I think she was like eighteen. Uh, she was she was born in forty seven. She started Doctor Who in sixty seven, so she was twenty. Mm. That's I mean. The, uh, by the way, uh, Noel's age is probably why they made Mickey older than Rose on Father's Day. Yeah. That's true. Um, let's see. Um, Wendy Padbury is currently retired and living in France. Uh, she had previously, other than her acting role, um, worked as a theatrical agent um, with clients uh, well-known in Doctor Who circles of Nicholas Courtney, Colin hmm. Baker, and Mark Strickson. And huh. she was the one that discovered Matt Smith at the National Youth Theater. Oh. Ooh. Happy birthday, Wendy. 
Yeah. Yes. Moving on, uh, we have Jenny Linden, who most people will not recognize right away, but when I say she was Barbara from the Doctor Who movies, which we reviewed uh, not that long ago, Jenny Linden turned 76 also on December 7th. Uh, Matt, are you looking at a picture of her right now? Yes, several. You know who she reminds me of? Hmm. Pamela Voorhees. A little bit. Just a wee bit. Mm -hmm. It's a little eerie. <coughs> um, slightly. More so when she has short hair. It looks like um, she is also uh, technically retired at this point. Not surprised. Eh, she, she does different roles in TV and stage, but she's not done anything um, really noteworthy of late. Bit parts, probably. Most likely. But, you know, she's been balancing stage, screen, and family, so more power to her. Happy birthday, Jenny. Mm -hmm. And then um, a happy birthday to Waris Hussein, who turned 77 yesterday. Waris Hussein was Doctor Who's first director. Yep. He was oh. the one that uh, originally directed the uh, the pilot for An Unearthly Child. Um, and then went on to direct several episodes of The Keys of Marinus. Hmm. Okay. Um, he was portrayed uh, in Adventures in uh, Space and Time. Uh, as being the principal director for like the first half. But it was only really those episodes he did. But still, he's Doctor Who's very first director and one of the people that just said it has to be William Hartnell that we get for this role. So if it was not for them, we would not have Hartnell as the first Doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, Warris is still directing at 77. Um, I'm trying to remember if he did anything... Um, recently that we'd be familiar with. I don't think so, because I believe he does mostly, like, TV and, uh... Um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. He, he, uh... Last thing I see he did was 1997, where he directed Sixth Happiness. So... Mm -hmm. He is still directing. He directs in both India and here, or, or India and England, and in the United States as well. So I was right there. He's done several TV movies. They should have got him to direct the uh, 96 Doctor Who movie. That would have been interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, happy, or he, they might have asked and he refused. We don't know. Anyway, happy birthday, Warris. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going to move on to our lost stories. Oh. Just one thing, there's, well, I'm, I'm trying to see if this person's still alive or not as I'm saying this. It looks like he is. There's another major name in Doctor Who that had a recent birthday, uh, which uh, is, uh, bah, go back to the birthday article here. Uh, Eric Sayward uh, actually uh, had his birthday as well. He's uh, not, not as well liked of a name, but he was a uh, script editor during an influential period of Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, he turned, it looks like, 61 today. He, he's the guy who no, wanted to kill everybody. No, 71, sorry, 71. Had to do the math quickly in my head. Uh, apparently they haven't updated his wiki page. Mm. Oh, okay. He, I'm like, I, 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 was, I was looking at the uh, the birthday list that you told me about on TARDIS Data Core, which is where I caught just caught it. December 1944, so it seems about the right time of year. <clears throat> Yes, his only uh, credits on IMDb are a ton of Doctor Who episodes here. Yeah, he was a huge Doctor Who fan. Yeah, he was the uh, he 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 wrote uh, the Cybermen and Dalek episodes of that time period, as well as being script editor for basically the Fifth Doctor run and the first season of the Sixth Doctor, uh, which he was canned shortly dur during the eighteen month hiatus. Yeah. Yeah. and company. Well, he he was known for um, what do you call it? He was known for having darker scripts too, where a lot of people died in them. Mm-hmm. 
it was a particularly bloody era of Doctor Who. He was also known for his um, um, dystopian science fiction writing. Yeah, I prefer dystopian science fiction writing. Meh. Anyway, uh, I, I got it. I got it, but Tim can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, happy birthday, Eric. <coughs> I can't believe I overlift I overlooked that one. I'll have to check that list and see where I missed it. Um, but yeah, we also have a lost story. Um, Nicholas Smith uh, died on Sunday, December sixth, after being hospitalized for seven weeks from a fall he took at his house. Mm. Mm. Um, he's eighty eighty one. Nicholas Smith um, was not a huge Doctor Who actor, but he did play a couple, He did play uh, in Doctor Who twice. He was the camp leader Wells in the Dalek Invasion of Earth, and then I believe he was in a uh, another uh, episode of Doctor Who as well later on. But it was you know another non really big role. Um, but yeah, he, uh, once you get over 80, you know, if you take a, a nasty fall, I don't know if he was cleaning out the gutters or fell down the stairs or what happened. Yeah. It looks like, uh, the Invasion of Earth was his only Doctor Who role and was his first television role. Mm. Mm. It was his first speaking role. He also okay. appeared in Zed Cars, Wurzel, Wurzel Grummage, and he was also a character in The Curse of the Were Rabbit. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I could have swore when I, I, I originally put this, wrote this yesterday. I could have swore when I put it up they had listed him as being in another episode of Doctor Who. Perhaps somebody corrected that. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Mm. It was like one during the Tom Baker era. So. Mm. Either way, um, I'm sure the world is a little dimmer by Nicholas's passing, but at 81, you have, had, you have hit the good run level. More or less, I, I yeah. I just wish he hadn't have suffered all that much. Well, I'm pretty sure if he was hospitalized, they had him on painkillers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our main news segment. All news, news unless stated otherwise, is from DoctorWhoNews.net. Mm -hmm. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> All right. So. UK Overnight Figures and Appreciation Index for our latest episode. Uh, 4.8 million viewers watched Hellbent, a 21.5% share of the total television audience. The increase may have been partly caused by Strictly Come Dancing running late, which was top for the day with 10.5 ITV and 7.7 .7 million for I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And 6.6 .6 for... The X Factor. Doctor Who was fifth for the day behind Pointless Celebrities. It received an audience appreciation index score of 82. In comparison, the highest AI score this week was 88 for a repeat of a Dad's Army on BBC Two. For those of you that don't know what it is, Dad's Army is a classic sitcom from the 70s about the uh, British Home Guard during World War II. Hmm. Hmm. A lot of cracks on how ill prepared they were during the beginning, but it's it has a very huge following in, in Britain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Australian overnight figures. Uh, we have uh, five hundred thirty four thousand viewers in the five major capital cities. I believe this is for also for Hellbent. Uh, the story was the highest rating um, ABC drama. That is a Australian broadcasting company drama of the day and the 10th highest rating program of the day overall. These ratings do not include iView, 
regional or time shifted viewers? Yes. Very good. Mm. So, moving yep. on, or do we have anything to say about that? Mm -mm. Not right. me. Well, the official Australian rating for Face the Raven was that this episode averaged. Uh, hold on. I lost them. 657,000 consolidated viewers in the five major capital cities. With 175,000 extra viewers, it was the highest time-shifted program of the day. 40,000 more than the next highest. And the 10th highest rating program of the day overall. These ratings do not include iView or regional viewers. The official UK rating of Heaven Sent is an official... 6.19 million viewers. That's the official consolidated rating, according to the Broadcasters Audience Research Board, BARB. This includes all those who watch the program within one week of transmission. It does not include iPlayer. Doctor Who was the seventh most watched program on BBC television and fourth overall on Saturday, beating out pointless celebrities, which had been ahead in the overnights. The episode finished to 27th in the chart with Strictly Come Dancing at number one with 11.55 million. The top 10 was once again dominated by the latest series of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here! Which took mm -hmm. seven of the top 10 places. Mm -hmm. I'll get them out of there, but they won't like it. <laughs> Tim. All right, moving on, we have off. our uh, upcoming episodes, starting, of course, with the. Cr well, Pretty much entirely uh, revolving around the Christmas special, which is the Husbands of River Song. Uh, we have our publicity images. We saw a, sm a small smattering of them last week. We've got a bit more this week. I'm not seeing much new that wasn't in the trailer, although I think this is the first time we've seen River uh, in conjunction with the TARDIS in this episode. Or actually, No, actually, I think we saw some images of her with it beforehand, but it does seem she's in the TARDIS without the Doctor, but with her, uh, I'm not sure if this is her new husband or not. I'm not sure. I, I actually think her husband might be the dude in the armor. I'm not certain. Um, oh, that's right, it's the head. And okay, yeah, that's not the guy in the other image, so. I don't know who that guy is. He looks familiar. But I don't know from what. I think it might just be from casting images of the episode. No, I think no, someone... I mean, uh, no. like I've seen him in something, oh, but okay. I don't know what I've seen him in. It's not Doctor Who related. It was some other show. Mm. I, I'll have to hear him to know. Mm. Uh, now there is speculation. Uh, I think this was Radio Times, which, is spec which speculates about everything because they seem to be really bored lately. Uh, fourth row, fourth image. Uh, the idea is that uh, that might be a headless monk. Hmm. I suppose it's possible, particularly being a River episode, so I could see it, you know, calling back to earlier River episodes. I don't see the point of including headless monks at this point, but I guess it could be. Yeah. It would explain why he's lost his head. Yeah. Still, you know, I mean, that's largely pure speculation. I, I saw their article on the ten things that you didn't know about this episode, and I had counted at least three more. So... I outdid them this year, so or the, this this week, so mm. cool. That you you counted things that you <clears throat> that you didn't know. No, I counted things that they listed that I'd caught, or that they ah. didn't list that I caught. I should say. Wow. Mm. Uh, bottom row, far left. Is that River or somebody else that, in that? That's River. Because she does not look happy. Yeah, that, that's no. River. No, she does not look happy. In my opinion, she also looks very pale. Yes, she does. Yeah. It looks, I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm kind of curious now. 
I'm a little so, curious what the doctor's holding in uh, fourth epi- fourth row second image there. A shiny metal ball. I don't know if I could get this to open up. I'd be happy. It's a Quidditch ball. It's Quidditch. They're playing. Quidditch. Yeah, that, that was one. That was one of my thoughts that it might be a golden snitch. It looks. Snitch, it looks except split. silver. Yeah, it looks like a silver version of the golden snitch. You're almost waiting for wings to come out of it. Seriously. Yep. Mm-hmm. Look at me. By the way, I won the game. I was getting the them to open. Cap of the I've been right-clicking and open a new tab, and that seems to be more successful. All right. I don't think there's anything more to say about these pictures. The rest of them are okay. pretty plain. Uh, latest edition of the Radio Times is out, and with it, the schedule for the Husbands of River Song. Uh, December 25th, of course, being Christmas Day, it will be out at 5.15 p.m. in the U.K. This is the first time since the 80s that Doctor Who has returned to its original time slot, although it's Christmas Day as opposed to Saturday, but still good uh, Good to see. It's uh I think, a better time for the target audience. Well, or at least close to it. Closer to it. Mm-hmm. This may be due to complaints that the BBC received from parents and children who were dismayed by the fact that the often late-running Strictly Come Dancing often put Doctor Who too late for children to watch. So, mm-hmm. potentially intentional. Uh, will this time change uh, now before dancing... Uh, or will this time change now before dancing be a spike in ratings for Who? And will this change be permanent once Series 10 rolls around? Only time will tell us. I highly doubt it. I'm kind of hoping. I I don't know what work schedules are like in the UK, uh, but just going off of standard, uh, you know, when rush hour and such is in the in the US, mm-hmm. I would think a time like 6 p.m. would be the best. Um, mm-hmm. Remember though, remember, remember though, for I Doctor for Doctor Who, this is Saturday. Oh uh, yeah. <sighs> I don't, and, yeah, and I don't you know also got to remember that it's tea time in England. <coughs> I've always worked Saturdays, so I never take five the, five, the p, five p.m. is tea time. It is literally time for afternoon tea in England. So, hmm. all right, children uh, children would have their afternoon tea and watch Doctor Who. Yeah. Is it really that, like, are meals really that regulated in Britain? It's itself? technically Cause... between 4 to 6 is usually yeah. when tea time is. But still, that's the ba- that was the basic concept for it. Okay. Uh, Space, the Canadian broadcaster for Doctor Who, have announced the broadcast time for the Husbands of River Song. Uh... December 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, let's see here. That's 8 it's, Central, 7 Mountain. Yeah, we'll put it n- uh, 9 hours after UK. Uh, this is preceded by a three-day Christmas with the Doctor Marathon. Uh, U.S. broadcaster BBC America has not yet listed the broadcast time, but they are advertising it. Generally, Space and BBC America broadcast at about the same time, so we can expect that to be very likely. Uh, yeah, at this point, the uh, BBC America website only has their schedule up until the 17th. And that was, I, I literally checked half an hour, well, closer to an hour ago now, but yeah. Yeah. And um, so we might know next week for certain when BBC America is having it, but we can pretty well assume that they're not going to be showing it in Canada and not be showing it in America at more or less the same time. All right. So moving on to events. Um, as traditional in de- as traditional for them in December, Bottoms, which is the oldest and largest auction house in the world to people not in the UK who not might not have heard of them, uh, holds an auction f- of entertainment memorabilia. What is unusual this year is the amount of both classic and new Who items. Hmm. Included this year are a Yeti control statue from the Web of Fear. The eggshell photon drive from Creatures of the Pit, that's a Tom Baker serial. Posters for the Psychic Circus from Greatest Show in the Galaxy. A chemical bomb prop from The Curse of Fenric, uh, both of those are Seventh Doctor serials. Uh, as well as uh, costumes from Torchwood and Sarah Jane Adventures, and scripts from both Classic and New Who. 
Geeks uh, might also desire some of the original promo posters for Star Wars from 1977, a clapper board from Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, mm. uh, original scripts from Superman 2 and Superman 3, and uh, prop posters from Harry Potter and the Pris Prisoner of Azkaban, the Have You Seen This Wizard poster, as well as a prop nut, that's Wizard Currency. Uh, this auction starts at noon tomorrow, Greenless Meridian, and will probably be done if you aren't watching us live, but if you are on one end of this auction, you can bid at www.bonhams.com. Uh, on a completely different note, BBC Entertainment, a standard definition channel that has operated globally since 2009, is beginning to be phased out uh, in most European areas. BBC America replaced BBC Prime and has been the primary source of Doctor Who old and new throughout Europe, Africa, and many other areas. In fact, it was responsible for one-third of the world record simulcast audience for Day of the Doctor. However, the BBC is replacing it with BBC First, a new high-definition channel. Uh, BBC Entertainment's final broadcast in those regions is 31 December, with its final Doctor Who uh, being Time of the Doctor on the 28th of December. Quote the BBC, BBC Entertainment will close across Central Europe from 1 January 2016. We would like to thank the BBC Entertainment audience for their support, but as the rollout for our new BBC channels gather pace and certain carriage agreements come to an end in some markets, the channel is not sustainable across CEE markets. BBC Worldwide's focus is on new genre brands, BBC First, BBC Earth, and BBC Brit. Central and, Eastern European, Central and Eastern Europe remains a priority market for BBC Worldwide. We are continuing to invest in our presence across the region and have and recently launched our premium factual brand, BBC Earth, as a linear channel in Romania, Hungary, and Slovenia. BBC Worldwide has strong partnerships with local free-to-air broadcasters, pay TV networks, and digital platforms in the region. Many BBC programs will continue to be seen through these providers in Central and Eastern Europe. The channel will close in the following regions, Albania, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Estonia, Georgia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Ukraine. No, no, you have to say in Wacko's voice. <laughs> Viewing of BBC Entertainment in UAE, Turkey, Israel, and Western Europe remains unaffected. Uh, so what does this mean for Doctor Who? Honestly, we don't know. BBC Entertainment has already phased out in Latin America, and rights to broadcast new episodes of Doctor Who went to SIFI there. Something similar could happen in Europe, or certain areas may be without Who until the BBC first launched the date for which has yet to be determined. And just because Western Europe and the Middle East is unaffected now, doesn't mean they won't be next on the chopping block in a few months. Mm -hmm. In brighter news, uh, French Doctor Who fans can rejoice. France 4, the French public entertainment channel with the airing rights to Doctor Who, has announced the premiere date on their channel for Series 9, December 26, the day after the rest of us has finished the series with the Christmas special. <laughs> so, why the three-month delay? Well, to dub the series into French, of course. Now, non-English-speaking French Doctor Who fans, and I'm sure there's at least a few of them out there, can find out what the rest of us has been talking about for the last three months, provided that translated internet pages haven't already spoiled them. As for the English-speaking ones, well, they've probably already seen the series on BBC Entertainment. So there. Cool. And in video news, BBC Store, the Beginner's Guide to Doctor Who. Uh, the BBC Store, a UK-only <clears throat> website with video available for download and streaming, has added a new bundle of Doctor Who to its store. The Beginner's Guide to Doctor Who is meant as a primer for new Doctor Who fans with a sampling of serials and episodes from throughout the show's 52-year history. Simon Farquhar of the BBC shop had this to say. Some people might feel a bit overwhelmed by Doctor Who and not know where to start exploring. If you've ever found yourself wondering ab about the history of the Who Universe, Okay, Who Universe. He that that's, that's, a, that's a direct quote. Hooniverse. I know. <laughs> Hooniverse. 
I just like that word. I don't know why. And how it evolved. Then our beginner's guide is here to help audiences navigate uh, time and space across the most imaginative world that television has ever created. We've tried to select stories that exemplify the different eras the show has gone through, from the eerie black and white beginnings to the gothic horror of the mid-70s, and the fast-paced furor of today's series. It has been difficult with so many episodes and Doctors to choose from, this, but this collection is a fun way to begin exploring Doctor Who. Episodes include our Tomb of the Cybermen, uh, Spearhead from Space, Genesis of the Daleks, The Talons of Wang Chang, Earthshock, Rose, Blink, The Day of the Doctor, and Mummy on the Orient Express. One might note the lack of an unearthly child, or in fact any of the first Doctor serials at all. Apparently the BBC store wanted to include an unearthly child, but their rights were st are still tied up in the TARDIS litigation suit from Anthony Coburn, which we reported about two years ago. We said then that we'll, and we'll say it now, you're a jerk, Anthony Coburn, a complete knee biter. Hmm. A complete and total bell end. I don't know um, if you guys remember that. That came around the same time as we were doing the Day of the Doctor. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. I, I was, uh, it was, yeah, it was one of those things uh, popping up around the 50th anniversary because yep. it was the absolutely most dickish time to do it. Yep, and I figured yeah. I figured it had been laughed out of court, but apparently I did research and it's still in litigation. Oh, my God. Well, remember, that um, was right around the time where every episode writer pretty much had the rights to the characters and and settings in their story and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, the reason why they can't use the Planet of the Savages or other items from the black and white era. So I can see parts of that, even if the TARDIS was not given to him, I can see parts of it having issues. Yeah, that's it's still kind of a dick thing by the Coburn family. So this guy, he basically came up with the TARDIS, and now he's saying that... He his father TARDIS. did. His father, his father did? His fa he claims that his father came up with the concept of the TARDIS being a police box. Okay. And as yeah. actually sued the BBC over it. Jeez. But he'd come up with the concept of it being blue. <laughs> it was a black and white show. That's kind of weird that they're able to show. How how is this only affecting an unearthly child in the because first time? because there's there's probably other details mentioned in the episode. He the the, the guy was the writer for that episode, okay. so it's probably saying that you know he owns this right, this right, this right, this right. The TARDIS is the one that gets the big publicity, but there's the smaller things are the ones affecting this incident. Mm. He's I think he's uh, he's suing for royalties. I think. Okay. Because, of course, nobody, when they originally wrote for Doctor Who, knew that 50 years later it would be pretty much the flagship drama of BBC and an international thing. Hmm. So now they're like, you know, hey, we had, a, we had something in this. Where's our money? Where's our royalty checks? It's really kind of dickish, guys. Yeah. Your, your, your parent was part of a pool of people who brainstormed ideas to make this show, and now you're claiming that they had sole right to it. Well, that, that's kind of like all the rights Terry Nation gets that Ray Kusick doesn't get to see a dime of. Oh, the guy that actually created the Dalek prop? Yeah. Yeah. Hard. Mm. So, moving on. Mm -hmm. Or should I say they're various estates, because I'm not sure if either one of them are alive at this point. I know Terry Nation's not, but moving on. Yeah. All right, the Underwater Menace release update. Uh, two mm. weeks ago, we mentioned that the website TV Shows on DVD.com had said that the Region 1 release of the Underwater Menace would be on January 19th, and we cautioned that this was unofficial and maybe incorrect. Well, now they are reporting that Amazon.com has listed the release date for March 1st, 2016. While this sounds believable and backed by a major retailer, it still has not is not o official as there is no confirmation by the BBC or to entertain 
and Amazon has gotten release dates wrong before. We'll keep you posted as we learn more. Yep. I, I do remember seeing something listed on Amazon coming out in August, I think, of a year or two ago, and it's still not out yet, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. While we don't cover month-to-month -month comic releases here, partially because none of us subscribe, partially because it stops bringing news once it's a monthly series, we do try to keep viewers apprised of changes in the lineup. While the Ninth Doctor received a five-part miniseries this year as part of the Titan comic celebration of the 10th anniversary of Russell T. Davies' revival of Doctor Who, reactions to the comic were positive enough that writer Kavan Scott will continue writing for the Ninth Doctor in a new ongoing series beginning April 2016. Interior artwork for the opening three-parter will be by Miss Marvel and Spider-Man's Adriana Mello. About the only uh, thing the Ninth Doctor is returning in lately. I well, that, that's that's because nice Chris doctor. Eccleston doesn't need to be there personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder oh. though. I wonder though if he has naysay rights on his likeness. Hmm. I think I cer certain amounts of it. I think he signed away, like in terms of like as part of the contract of being the doctor, which is why they were able to use say stock footage for Day of the Doctor and things like that. But I'm I'm sure there are is a certain degree of rights. So also BBC Books announced today a new hardcover book to be released tomorrow. The Legends of a Shielder is a series of short stories on the life and times of Macy Williams series nine character from the press junket. Quote Doctor Who, The Legends of a Shielder, never before told stories of the woman who lived. Written by James Goss, Jenny T. Colgan, David Llewellyn, and Justin Richards! Mm. Published by BBC Books on December 10th. 10,000 hours is all it takes to master any skill. 20,000 and you're the best in the world. Over 100,000 and you're the best there's ever been. A shielder, a young Viking girl, died helping the Doctor and Clara to save her village. Brought back to life by the Doctor using alien technology, she is now immortal, the woman who lived. Since then, a shielder has kept journals, detailing her extraordinary life. The Legends of a Shielder is a glimpse of some of those stories, the terrors she has faced, the battles she has won, and the treasures she has found. These are tales of a woman who lived longer than she should ever have lived and lost more than she can ever remember. This title features a shielder as played by Wizzy Williams. The Legends of a Shielder is set between her first two encounters with the Doctor as shown in the 2015 episodes The Girl Who Died and The Woman Who Lived. Anybody want to bet there's going to be a, psych a sequel titled something like The Legends of Me? Probably. <laughs> or the... Or the Legends of a Shielder 2, The Adventure of Me. Hey, there's a competition. To be in with a chance to win a copy of The Legends of a Shielder, courtesy of BBC Books, simply answer the following question. By the time of the Doctor's encounter with the Shielder in 17th century England, her father had become a distant memory. What was his name? Please send your answers along with your name, address, and where you heard about the competition to comp hyphen legends at doctorwhonews.net with the subject, don't mind to me, ellipses. The competition is to residents of the United Kingdom only. Dag nabbit. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. Closing date, December 31st. Only one entry per household will be accepted. Of course. Yes. Speaking of that being UK only, are these normally released in the states, or I'm not, I'm not sure. Imported? I'm not sure if uh, these will be released directly to the U to the U.S. Um, or if they have to go through a third party company. I think they, at the very they, least, it looks like Amazon is going to have it, so it's not like it's international shipping. To okay, it so at if all. Amazon has it, that means it's going to be in release in North America. You can get it from a bookstore that carries Doctor Who books. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, ours was Borders. I think we can still get it from Barnes & Noble. Yeah. You should be able to get it from Barnes & Noble. You should be able to special order for, through them, too. If they don't happen to have it. 
Yeah, I know. Usually. I just miss borders. Yar. All right, moving on to our uh, audio news from BigFinish.com. Uh, Doctor Who The Churchill Years Volume 1 has a trailer out. Uh, have, has anybody on the chance to listen to the trailer? I actually have not listened to it. I this have one listened yet. to it. I listened to all all the all of the trailers that I uh, could while I was putting up the news. I actually wrote most of the news yesterday and then just updated it today. Um I listened to it. It sounded semi interesting, but I I think they might go a little too far because it sounds like they're actually making Churchill a companion, so to speak. And they obviously have... Oh, so he's actually traveling in the TARDIS? I think so, or dealing a lot regularly with the Doctor. Um, it is read, read by the guy that did Churchill in Victory of the Daleks, and he's doing the voice for most of the parts, too. It's kind of like how they did um, Destiny of the Doctor. So they got him doing like 90% of it, and then the occasional other voice doing stuff. And I didn't like that when they did Destiny of the Doctor that way. So yeah, it's 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 based on yeah, it's like the Companion Chronicles, and I mean part of that is because they're not going to have Christopher Eccleston, David Tennant, and Matt Smith at this yeah, point. Yeah, I know, but it's it's how the the format of it seems very confused. It yeah. doesn't know whether it's trying to be an audio book or an audio drama. Yeah, it just. I mean that that's that's something the Companion Chronicles tends to have. This is just a a, a version of that by a not actual companion. How is the uh, do they give enough glimpse of the narration? Does he have all of his Churchill inflection in there, or is it basically it, he, he, sa he sounds like his Churchill inflection? Yes, but then he tries to do Matt Smith's Doctor, and that's nowhere near as successful. Ha. Huh. Uh, for those uh, who may have forgotten or who may have missed us talking about it before, uh, this is essentially uh, a series of adventures, uh, four, four adventures with Winston Churchill. The first three are him each uh, with the 9th, 10th, and 11th Doctor, although we know that he has met, I believe, the 6th Doctor and possibly others. They're not included here because this is part of the New Who uh, Big Finish line. The fourth is a crossover between... Uh, Lily Arwell from The Doctor, The uh, Widow in the Wardrobe, with uh, Churchill, who is at this point now retired. Okay, our next piece is uh, recently released was Torchwood One Rule, featuring uh, Tracy Ann Oberman as Yvonne Hart from Army of Ghosts Doomsday. So that is part of the ongoing uh, Torchwood monthly lineup. And we also have uh, the announcement that uh, for the information on the February 2016 entry into that same series. Torchwood More Than One, uh, starring Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper. Gwen Cooper has triumphed against impossible odds before, but now she's finally met her match. Roger Hug, Pugue, Puff, not entirely certain. Planning officer for Cardiff City Council. Mr. I'm going to say Pug because that's the best I'm going to say. Doesn't believe the world needs Torchwood. Gwen, sells, set, Gwen sets out to prove him wrong. For Mr. Pug, it's a day that will change his life if he can survive it. This is written by Guy Adams, starring Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper and Richard Nichols as Roger Pug. And it is the series finale to the first series of Torchwood. So it will wrap up the conspiracy storyline, presumably. And the beginning of a brand new era for Torchwood 3. This episode will also contain a cameo from a Torchwood lesson, uh, legend. One that fans will need to listen carefully to discover. Hmm. Interesting. That's... Uh... I'm kind of curious as to who their legend's going to be. Hmm. There, there's speculation. I've seen people saying anyone from, uh, I'm blanking on his real name, but uh, Spike, uh, among uh, other characters. James. Uh, James Marsters. There yeah. we go. Mm. We'll have to see. 
All right. Uh, there is a final piece of news. It is not who related, but it was big enough to be reported on, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, for the uh, past uh, three weeks, uh, well, actually, first of all, I'm sure many of you who grew up in the 80s and 90s might remember a little show called Mystery Science Theater 3000. Mm -hmm. um, it was a uh, show that uh, aired on Comedy Central and later on the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, and what it did is it chose an old movie and it made fun of it with uh, the star and two robots. Um, who were, uh, according to the plot, trapped in a satellite orbiting Earth and being inflicted uh, with these movies by mad scientists. It was a silly premise, and it was a silly show, but it was funny, and it was worth a lot of laughs. Um, the show went off the air in, I believe, 2003. Um, and since then, it is still has a massive cult following. Well, in recent times, the original creator of the show and its original star, Joel Hodgson, has gotten full rights to the show and has started a Kickstarter to um, bring it back. It has been running for three weeks now and has gained uh, over $4.4 million. However, um, while that does guarantee that he will be able to make nine new episodes, he is trying to make an even dozen. And to do that, he needs $5.5 million. It is an obtainable goal, but a difficult one. Um, as of right now, there is 49 hours left. Um, the official Kickstarter total is $4.28 million. There is some extra money that has been gotten through bonus that has put it around 4.6. But the goal is 5.5. So if you ever liked MST3K... Um, and you have even, you know, $20, $50 that you can contribute to this, I would suggest going to their Kickstarter webpage and contributing just so that you can see more MST3K. They've already announced um, many things about the new series. Um, uh, it is uh, not going to be Joel Hodgson in space. He's already had his time. It is going to be Jonah Ray from The Nerdist. Um, the Mad Scientist is going to be played by Felicia Day. Um, they have all new voices for Crow and Servo. Voices slash puppeteers. Oh, they're going to be both the voices and the puppeteers again? That's usually how it runs. Yeah, I wasn't sure since those the people that they chose were comedians that I weren't uh, puppet comics, but we'll see. Oh, how else are you going to sync it, though? Very carefully. Easiest ways to have them run it. Either way, he still needs to raise about 900k in just a little over two days. So, and that will get a full 12 episodes of MST3K, which he is going to try to ship to TV. But if anything, it'll at very least be streamed live. Mm -hmm. mm. They'll at least end up somewhere online where people can easily access it. Um, he is also planning something apparently in the last day or so, uh, to hopefully help, uh, he's get a big boom a, for... He's planning a marathon. Or something to that effect, yes, to get um, a big boom for people or interested Or, excuse in me, it. not a marathon, a telethon mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, probably off the Bring Back MST3K website. That is, by the way, the website you can go to for this, bringbackmst3k.com. Yeah, live countdown telethon with Joel and friends starts Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific. That's 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And all um, all week they're doing a double feature of MST3K from the website as well at 4 and 7 p.m. Pacific. So, again, that's 7 and 10 Eastern. But yes, please, if you have the if you have the ability, put in what you can. Bring back MST three K. Let it be shown to a whole new generation. A whole new generation to witness it for the first time, Randy. Matt and I, uh, Matt and I um, were very big on uh, the craptacular for our anime club, which we kind of did in the vein of MST3K. 
Um, Aaron uh, originally created the Iron Butt Challenge, which does the same thing, and Matt currently runs it. And that's what we do. That's one of the things that we'll, that's done at GeekCon. I will destroy people's souls next year. <laughs> Actually, the next two years, it's going to be real hard to get through that run. We already have next this next convention planned, and I already have my first movie for uh, 2007. Uh, be an, 2017. On, on, an, on, uh, an hour straight of Donald Trump and Ben Carson trying to speak. Oh, God. Mm. <coughs> no, no. I want to crush their souls, not their minds, Bill. <laughs> no, I, I, I... Matt and I occasionally chit-chat and, 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 and come up with, with plans. And... Uh, the twenty the twenty sixteen GeekCon was literally thought of at the viewing's desk. Um, <laughs> As we were sitting year. there, just kind of grumbling about how many people managed to get through it. Yeah, we sat there and we went, "Wait a minute, this is what we should do," and tried that. And then I came up with some ideas. I fire at Matt over Skype, and I, I'm wondering how much the MST3K guys do the exact same kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, this movie I planned, Randy. I have not shared the name of it with you. No, and don't over this. I, I will not do it over the podcast, but I will say this. I've watched these people watch it, and then I've watched their reactions when they had to try to remember what happened in the movie. They reacted like they had just been through a war and were having post-traumatic stress disorder. What you want is a movie so bad that if you chained people to the seats, they would gnaw off their own feet to get out. Oh, this will work. Okay. <laughs> so that's all the news we have, and I think that's a good chunk of our discussion, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we should probably get to the five-minute challenge. Yep. Who wants to do the five-minute challenge? Not it. Not it. Tim and Aaron are already saying no. I assume right. Bill is not prepared, so... All right, I got it. Okay. Okay, doke. We're ready? Yep, uh, go ahead and put on the uh, the stopwatch and tell me when you're ready. I've already got it right here. So, starting in three, two, one, go. We start in the Nevada desert as a pickup truck drives up the road and stops at a diner. Uh, the door opens and the doctor gets out, strapping his guitar to him and walking into the diner. Um, the diner's vacant except for the person behind the counter, who, after a moment's notice, we, no we see is Clara. The doctor walks up. Um, she asks them if he wants anything. He says he doesn't have any money and proceeds to play a song, um, which most Doctor Who fans will recognize as Clara's theme in a bit of uh, breaking the fourth wall. Um, Clara mentions that uh, it seems a sad song, and the doctor begins to tell her a story about a person that he's heard of named Clara. He goes along the lines of the fact that uh, he arrived at Gallifrey uh, and uh, basically told a kid to tell the High Council. The High Council is freaking out because every cloister bell in the cloisters is going off. A guard down there informs them that the wraiths are active, and they assume that this is an imminent crisis to everything. And, of course, the fact that the doctor has arrived has made things even worse for them. Well, the doctor comes to his old house, the one that we saw in Day of the Doctor and in Listen, and stands in the loft looking out. When a lady comes in, tries to shoo him off, saying it's for the kids, but upon seeing his face, says, they'll kill you, and runs off. The doctor pays really no never mind, comes out, and she's later serving him a bowl of soup with a whole crowd of people around him. He's eating, or he's about ready to eat said soup when a flyer flies up, informs everybody to step away from the doctor, tells him to put down his weapons, to at which he drops his spoon, <laughs> and accompany him to the capital, which he then proceeds to walk forward, draw a line in the sand, and walk back and finish his soup. 
flabbergasted the council doesn't know what to do. The general, who we last saw in Day of the Doctor, suggests talking to him. They send the general as a representative, who's promptly ignored. Then the high council appears, and they're promptly ignored. Rassilon, infuriated, says, what, are, uh, what does he want? And it's like, and um, what's her face? The mistress from Karn, who has shown up, exclaims, he's not angry at Gallifrey for what happened. He's angry at you. So Rassilon shows up personally, flanked by the general and guards. The doctor walks out to him, drops his uh, dial, on the, his uh, confession dial, in, in the line and tells Rassilon succinctly to get the hell off his planet. Rassilon doesn't react well to this and orders the guards to shoot the doctor. The guards ready, aim, and fire, and all miss deliberately, forming an outline of the doctor in the wall behind him. They then proceed to throw down their weapons and join the doctor on his side of the line. Um, as more flyers show up, Rassilon is smug that he's gotten reinforcements, but they're not his. There's the, they're the doctors. The guards had served with the doctor during the war and knew better than to cross him. And then the general, putting down his own gun, tells Rassilon to get the hell off the doctor's planet, which he does. The doctor then informs him that the High Council should take the next shuttle off. They want to know about the hybrid, which was mentioned in the previous episode. The doctor corrects the general as he's talking about it, and, but doesn't reveal too much that they already know. He says he'll need an extraction chamber and, a device, and uh, then proceeds to step into Clara's life the moment before she died and extract her to Gallifrey. After the doctor and Clara talk for a bit, uh, the general reveals to her that she is, uh, does not have a heartbeat, that she's missing the sound of her own heartbeat and that uh, she is trapped between uh, one, basically the second before she dies. Um, the doctor then takes this moment to punch the general, steal his gun, and after trying to talk and after trying to listen to the general talk him down, shoot him, forcing the general to regenerate. The doctor and Clara then escape into the cloisters. The cloisters are a maze of living circuitry under Gallifrey. The doctor had been there before as a child and tells Clara the story as they look for the secret exit. While the doctor is digging it up, the newly regenerated general and one of the guards come up and try to talk Clara out of it, along with, I believe, the uh, priestess of Karn, whose name I could never remember, Ohelia or something like that. Oh Ohela, yeah. Um, it is then that Clara learns that the doctor has just spent 4.5 billion years trapped in the dial and realizes that part of that is what's been eating at him and part of it is the guilt that uh, he should have been able to save her. Um, she distracts them long enough for the doctor to escape, steal a TARDIS, and run away with her, which is what the doctor always does, taking a moment to bask in the classic TARDISness. Um, the doctor then proceeds to run even further into the end of time than Gallifrey is currently hiding, where they get to the very end of things where they find a Shilder sitting there watching the end of the universe in her own little protective time bubble in what looks to be the remains of Gallifrey. The doctor and her talk for a bit. First, the doctor accuses her of being the hybrid. Then, the, then she accuses him of being it. And then she finally accuses the doctor and Clara together being the hybrid. And the doctor reveals that he's planning on wiping Clara's memories so she can live out the rest of her life without knowing who the doctor is. But Clara has been listening from the TARDIS scanner. When they get in a brief argument, it uh, comes out, and the, uh, eventually they decide that they need to do it mm -hmm. together. Clara has already attempted to reverse the polarity of the memory-wiping device that the doctor stole from Gallifrey, um, and they try potluck to see who'll get it, and it's the doctor that winds up losing his memories of Clara, which takes him back to where he is in Nevada, where he woke up without any memory without any memories of her. He has pieced together 
from the holes in his memory of who Clara is and what she was, but has no direct memories, no face, no voice, nothing. As he's telling this to this waitress, who he does not recognize, she says that maybe, you know, forgotten memories become a song, and disappears into the back room of the diner, which the doctor recognizes as being the one that he was in with Amy and Rory, but was at the other side of the hill. As he's doing this, the diner disappears in a familiar wheezing sound, revealing that it was, in fact, a TARDIS piloted by a shoulder, and be left behind is the doctor's own TARDIS. Walking in, he finds a note that he should stop thinking about the past and concentrate on being the doctor. Then the console emits him a new sonic screwdriver, and he goes off on his way. Alrighty. That was probably a long one. Uh, yeah. <coughs> it's a you, finale. Deal with it. Mm -hmm. You did it in eight minutes and about ten seconds. Yeah, again, it's a, fr it's a finale. Deal with it. There was a lot that Meh. was packed into that finale. I could have done it in five minutes. Ah, eh, bite me. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't. You didn't, did you? Yeah, because Randy volunteered first. I would have nonchalantly gone and not Okay, I'll do it, but he did first. Okay, so let's move on to what we liked, what we didn't like, and Matt, you're up. <laughs> of course. Oh, what I liked. Hey, He's we're on Gallifrey again. Nice to see Gallifrey again. It's been how long? Um, since uh, the 50th anniversary. And even then, it was only a brief visit, though. We were on Listen. We were on Gallifrey and Listen for a few minutes. That was a flashback, <laughs> and one I repressed out of my memory. Yeah, that's for the best. Ah, uh, but it's not. It's nice to see Gallifrey. It's nice to see there's more to Gallifrey. I'd like to see even more of it, please. But yeah. then again, after this <laughs> happened, who knows? All I'm right. sure there's more issues when he gets back. Tim? <laughs> I really liked the framing device of the uh, doctor telling his story to Clara in the diner. Because, like, it, it kept revealing, this, you know, the, like, the, the point of it all very nicely and uh, like trying to guess you know like is, is this just like another figment of the doctor's imagination like that that that's what i thought i thought they were going off the queue uh from heaven sent and this was all in the doctor's head well and then they then they reveal the memory wipe device so you think he's telling it to an amnesiac clara and it turns mm. out of course the wham of it being that it was mm. the other way around telling the story to a wan random waitress in a diner who just happens to turn out to be Clara. Mm-hmm. All right, Bill, how about you? I'm going to say I like that this is kind of uh, the Doctor's version of Face the Raven. I would have liked it probably more if it was uh, it either forced a regeneration of the showrunner or the Doctor, but even still it was pretty fitting in that Face the Raven was uh, Cl uh, Clara's punishment for hubris. She, you know, meddled and assumed and faced the punishment. And here the doctor meddles and assumes and faces the punishment. I'm actually glad they didn't regenerate him because we've only had two seasons of Capaldi and I really don't want to lose him just yet. Yeah. Capaldi's good. I mean, I'm just saying, like, for ignoring all other aspects, this is a good regeneration, would be a good regeneration story, and I kind of felt like it might have been nice if they had used it for the regeneration. But, I mean, it, 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 it is they, good, they, you know, they, to have they, Capaldi. It would have been nice if Moffat had regenerated. They, they, they trolled it a bit. It was kind of off-put by the fact that we knew he was in the Christmas special. Yeah. But they did troll it with the next episode titles of them. The, the firing squad shooting at the doctor following by them reporting a regeneration. Mm -hmm. Because Moffat is a colossal troll. Sure. <laughs> why, why, why? 
which is the whole point of the whole wham reversal and the uh that we were just talking about with tim all right uh aaron what about you what was your favorite thing all out? um my favorite thing overall um i like the cloisters i think they led to kind of a really ominous eerie atmosphere to everything i you know the they, they lent a little bit more depth to to the uh, episode, I think. Yeah, um, we've, we've seen plenty of shiny, normal interiors of the big domes of Gallifrey, yeah. and we've seen the outside now a bit. Yeah, this we've the seen the outside, we've, seen, we've, seen, we've seen the regular Gallifreyans, we've seen the shiny hall, the shining halls of the uh, Time Lords, now we see kind of more of the ugliness of the You've Time seen, Lords. Now, now you see the dusty server room that nobody cleans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Although I was a bit disappointed <coughs> with the common Gallifreyans because mm. their clothing was very, very, very Earth standard. Yeah. that's. Remember, I looked at it and I was like looking at their clothing and I was like, so the Doctor's on Earth now. I'm like, no. Yeah, it was. that was kind of... I'm looking at that. That's like it's a blouse and a dress that you a could cowboy hat. that you could buy, you know, at um, a secondhand store. I'm like, wow, really? No, nothing alien about it at all, huh? I, I kind of felt that was a costuming failure. Yeah, they didn't need to be as fancy as the Time Lords, but they should have had something a little bit different. Yeah. A, a less ornate, uh, like a much less ornate robe, like a basic robe. No collar, just robe, you know? Kind of thing. Instead of the uh, very too common to be anywhere but Earth style right. clothing. Not alien enough. Correct. Um, all right, so what I liked about the episode... I liked all the callbacks um, in the music and in the in the dialogue. Um, like the fact that when uh, I guess the uh, was that was it supposed to be an orphanage or something? I'm not sure we ever say what it is. I mean, she, it's it's something to that effect. Either I mean, it it seems too small to be a boarding school, so an orphanage might be what it is. But um. When she looks up and she sees the doctor, we hear the doctor's theme from the ninth and tenth era. Something we haven't heard in over five years. Right. And I, I heard that and it just actually sent a chill down my spine. And then of course we had, you know, the that's always four knocks um at the end, which I thought was we which I, I think was uh, was me trolling the doctor because by now she's had plenty of time to find out about the Ood's prophecy. <laughs> she sees a TARDIS at the end of time. She's like, I'm going to knock four times. There were all those little sidelines and things like that. Um, I wonder if it was her knocking and listen. Uh, that was also said around this time period. It's possible. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm actually wondering about what about the humans in Utopia? Isn't I was kind of wondering. This is, I think this is a. I think this is a little after. This is after they die, basically. Okay. <laughs> that's probably. Yes, that's, if we notice, they do like to go to the end of time very frequently. Yeah, and it's a little okay. different every time. Personally, I would have found it amusing in hell as he had gone there and a shielder was sitting in a bar. Oh, excuse me, in a restaurant. Restaurant. A certain and so that whole in a conversation was going on in a booth while, you know, everybody else is dining and eating meals. I would have been laughing my ass off. What would have been even better if a certain fifth doctor came by with a familiar costume? <laughs> or a modified version of said costume. I would have just liked it if they borrowed the voice. If nothing else, yeah. Excuse me, I'm the dish of the day. How would you like to eat me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
All right. So, what didn't you like, Matt? Oh, what didn't I like? Rassilon was really kind of pathetic. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. If that's you're true. apparently, you know, <laughs> if this had been Timothy Dalton as Rassilon, that would not have happened. Oh, it definitely right. would not have happened. Yeah. I mean, he could have. He would have still done the same thing. Those guards would have fucking done it because he's freaking Timothy Dalton. Oh, I, I could just I could just see him, you know, like quivering with rage, yelling at the doctor. Mm-hmm. I would see them actually. I could easily see that he would l- at least would have forced some sort of physical confrontation of some sort. Instead, we get this withered, not quite sure old guy. Missy must have done a fucking number on him. No shit. No kidding. By the way, kudos to the master for kicking his ass. Apparently. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm like, yeah, apparently all three of them regenerated at the end of that special, but how the mass- that's, that's that's the impression I get from this. I think probably what happened is, you know, uh, that frickin' hand of death worked on the master who was already half dead kind of backfired. Right. Gave the master some lives and possibly stole some from well, I mean, Rassilon. The, the master was already stealing life energy from people and from Rassilon, so he probably forced a regeneration from that. Well, I, I'm saying the glove probably had a partial hand in it, too. Right. Some kind mm-hmm. of weird back. Because remember what those gloves' powers were. Because remember the other one was in Torchwood and it put, gave put people back to life for like a few moments. Is that the idea? Are they supposed yes, to be Yes, it's same the glove? same model glove. It's the other, the but it's for the other hand. It's yes. the other version of the smitten mitten. So, yeah, they were that was supposed to be a piece of Gallifrey tech. So that's, that's what they were foreshadowing. I was waiting for that to pay off. Okay, that well, makes sense. Now, yes, now, now, you, now you know. I thought I'd mentioned that way back in the... I thought uh, we mentioned before, too, yeah. If, if so, I didn't quite grasp what you were saying. Yeah, so apparently with the Master being in his undead zombie state, the other glove had a backlash effect. Drained a few of Dalton's lives, gave them to the master, who promptly regenerated, crossed the gender lines, and the and um, the Dalton Rassilon exhausted, regenerated into old guy. I'm going to refer to him as old man, old not man. old man, old man, old man. Anyway, um, he came off though as being completely ineffectual and impotent. I'm- Nothing I'm sure when he comes back to punish the doctor for this, he's going to have regenerated again because this is not a, an incarnation that we can, re, you know, nobody's losing any sleep picturing this reincarnate this incarnation coming back, coming after them. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. He comes back as like uh, Pierce Brosnan or something. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I'm after you now. Da 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 da. Okay. Uh, How about Tim? What didn't you like? Uh, I thought it was kind of a letdown that after finally getting back on Gallifrey, the doctor helps himself to some soup. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, he was basically just biding his time. What if Rassilon comes back as Patrick Stewart? Uh, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's like, the I, doctor I, 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 I've been waiting for this a moment myself, you know, maybe I haven't been waiting four and a half billion years, but still, you know, <laughs> I, I'd like a bit more bang for my buck, even though I'm watching I this for think free. part of it was irony. Yeah. Part of it is irony, part the, of the do- it is the also... Do- the, doctor, the doctor has a sense of showmanship, and his sense is that... I'm going to have some soup so that it's, when the uh, I'm going to have homemade soup me, I haven't I had in a while. Soup. Well, no. <laughs> remember when he was trapped in the uh, in the thing? What was that that he always had that was in the room that reset? A bowl of soup. Oh, that's right. So he comes back. He finally fights his way out after billions of years. Makes it onto Gallifrey. Comes back to his old home. And, and and what does the matron serve him? <laughs> the same damn bowl of soup. <laughs> That's why he stares at it. He's like, oh, God, I just had this. I just had this, like, several times. Like four, four and a half billion years worth of soup. 
several times <laughs> I can remember of recently, but... Unless he got all his memories back when he left the thing. I had hope not, otherwise that's a mental scar that'll never go away. No, yeah, I think he only actually lived through it once. Technically, he only lived through it once, but he lived through the shock of the realization. But then again, I mean, he's slightly psychic, so he probably started eventually to pick up, you know, some psychic aftermath. Possibly. Uh, I don't know, because he is, he is pretty damn deranged coming into this. He's obviously very angry because he knows what happened. Mm -hmm. he, he's put the, that, puzzle, he's mean, put the puzzle he, together. He also, I think, is realizing, hey, the guy that just was trying to end civilization is still in fucking charge. Yeah. Well, not civilization, but life in the universe. No, he was trying to end the universe. Yeah. He was trying to implement the final sanction. He was going to rip apart time. The same right. thing they're accusing the hybrid of doing. So... My dad. <laughs> great. Um... Bonus hypocrite points there, Time Lords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yep. But no, that's the whole soup thing was it was literally a throwback to that's all he's had to eat for well, the next 4.5 billion years. To be fair, the High Council needed a scapegoat in order to uh, calm down their citizens after the Time War. Didn't work too well because everybody knew that the Doctor was a fucking hero. Yeah. And that the, and that the Council of Time Lords is shit. They have been. Actually, the count, the High Council has been either incompetent or corrupt for most of the Doctor Who's life. Yes, but now the, even the public uh, Gallifreyans on the no. lower tier know for sure now at this point. Um, all right, Bill, how about you? What about your least favorite thing? Um, I uh, had a least uh, in favorite general. scene picked out, but I'm not sure if I had not, a general Not seen thing. in general, right. yeah. I don't think if I have anything that's not covered, uh, I don't want to linger, obviously. Yeah, unfortunately, mine was Rassilon, and Matt took it, so... I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I think my main one was the, uh... The... Actually, well, yeah, was the, uh... The, the people being too earthly. I am going to say the lack of... I can understand why, despite the many parallels, Charlie wasn't referenced, but it would have been nice... Or I, you know, it was a little disappointing that neither Leela nor Romana was even, you know, Hinted mentioned at. in passing conversation. Yeah. Just yeah. the idea that one of them is probably around. Still, you know, the fact that Rassilon was in power, and according to even Russell T, Rom Romana was the one that at the beginning of the war right. means that she was deposed. She was either voted down or deposed by Rassilon. But one, once he took Rassilon's place, you'd think, I mean, I obviously, was, I mean, it, it wasn't his first priority, but it would have been nice for some reference to those companions or, or for a K-9 to show up. It, I actually would have been funny instead of being the person that apparently was the, the matron when the doctor was there would have been funny if the person that was exiled and taking care of the kids was Romana. Right. That would have been just like holy. That would have been a great holy. Or, or, or if the doctor walked into the council chamber and they're like, "Well, in addition to the artifacts of Rassilon, there is another presidential artifact that Rassilon refused to use." Greetings, master. <laughs> <laughs> At, well, actually, that would be Mark Two. Yeah, they, yeah. they're technically not going. They're going to ignore Mark One. Because uh, just just as a tip of the hat to the uh, guys that are doing uh, the K nine series, because that's supposed to be the Mark one, right? So somehow it got off Gallifrey and got back to Earth again. And what that says about what happened to Leela, we don't know. But you right. know, considering how long it might have been, she might have lived the end of her natural life. Yeah. Yes, yeah, just saying. She's probably passed mm -hmm. on by now, and so that K nine it's technically on its own. Unless she had kids. Unless she had kids. Uh, can't, couldn't. She was a human. They were time lords. They're not biologically Oh, compatible. that's right. Yeah. Mm. Although Rom Romana could have sent it off on a secret mission. Yeah. Because they were, they, I mean, Big Finish, but they were working together. And even even not considering Big Finish, they could have met, you know, two, two, two canines on one planet, they could have met. I think they did at one point. Anyway. Um... Aaron, how about you? What's your least favorite thing? 
Hmm. My least favorite thing. Uh huh. I guess I was kind of disappointed in the heart looping thing or the biological looping of um of Clara. Uh, as a gimmick or as it was explained? Um, kind of more as a gimmick. I mean, if if they had brought her back right after at the end of the episode and put her back in place, um, instead she takes off with me, and I, I am kind of excited to hear about what Big Finish might... If, if Big Finish picks up, you know... I'm pretty sure that... that Nick Briggs read the script and go, hey, Steven, could you make this at the end and leave it open-ended? Well, well hopefully, it may, hopefully it's, you know, not, was it the BBC audio stuff that's taking off, too, and, like, BBC books and, well, well generally that won't when, really affect the generally, finish the generally, books, but. generally, when BBC audio <laughs> makes an audio adventure like that, they actually subcontract it to Big Finish. Yeah. Okay. Like Destiny of the Doctor. Yeah. Okay. So uh, normally that still goes to Big Finish because they do really good work, and they be someone who does really good I'm, work. I'm pretty sure that was written into the script deliberately as a way of uh, uh, both of them being able to be picked up by Big Finish to do adventures mm -hmm. together. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's 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 as, as a way. I, of, I like it, but it's also still kind of sequel baiting. It, yeah, in it a is. way. So there's no real closure for it unless you you. Uh, listening to the big finish audios, and even then, are the big? How long are the big finish audios going to go until they actually finish them? Are, are big, they even big, going to have big an fi actual big finish? Thing? Prefers to leave things <laughs> open ended anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Clara would pretty much live forever if big finish is the ones that handle it. Uh, <laughs> Do yeah. Doctor Who tends to leave things open ended sometimes, much to my yeah. annoyance. Like, whatever happened to the Doctor's daughter? Remember? And we're, no, we're not taking yeah. the WOG statement that she flew into a moon after after the regeneration. Who said that? Russell. Oh, you did, yeah. You didn't it know It was that? in an interview recently. I actually told you about that, hon. And you laughed it off. Mm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was being flippant. <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, it was uh, as Stephen Moffat had said, he didn't realize that he was the reason why... Uh, why she had survived that it was his comment that caused the change in the script and then russell said ah don't worry about it she flew into a moon anyway uh so it basically mm -hmm. stephen had said something to russell prompting russell to change it to the into the fact that she lived and then they did then stephen moffat did nothing with it <laughs> hmm. yeah and that was basically yeah, him being flippant afterwards, going, ah, don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I am excited to see what they're going to do, but at the same time, there it's just kind of lacks the closure that I kind of want at the end of a series finale. Um, it also takes away some of the impact of, you know, the first companion death in many uh -huh. years. Yeah. To an extent. Mm -hmm. um, you can stop that, Matt. <laughs> um, it only does it to an extent, though, because um, it depends on how long she can wander time and space with no repercussions. It is, it is, it is implied that eventually she has to go back and meet her fate. Yeah, but if that's you know, five years, five months, five hundred years, you know, then it takes away the sting a bit. Contrary to what Stephen Moffat, writer of Angels Takes Manhattan, might think, just being separated from the doctor but living out your life is not actually death. Mm-hmm. Saving me. It does remind me a bit of... Um... The Doctor and um, Romana being called back to Gallifrey and then going, yeah, let's just do this first, you know, and then let's do this first. She's procrastinating. Ah. <sighs>
Anyway, um, so where were we in, uh, I think we were up to me, uh, for things I don't like, and mine was the yes, same I as Matt's. So. Mine was largely Rassilon, um, and I will add, I, um, the, the, um, yeah, between Rassilon and the costumes, I'm pretty, those are the two things that, in general, that I didn't like on this, so I'm gonna have to pass. And then we're up to your favorite scene, Matt. Favorite scene. Oh, I'll probably steal something from someone somewhere. Go ahead. I've got several. Mm. Um, I guess just to go with one, um, uh, one of my favorite scenes, uh, out of the dozen or so, uh, when Clara figures out how long she's been away and what the doctor, why the doctor has been so kind of desperately manic to get her away from everybody and to get the both of them out of there. Okay. That that that, that kind of just sunk in for a few minutes there. Okay. I really don't have much to say about that, but yeah, that was a, a decent scene. Tim. I really liked the earth-shattering performance of that guy who said, You okay, mister? Clara told me to watch over you. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't know what to say about that either. I, uh, I, I, I was not actually impressed by that in the least. Actually, I'm just kidding. Um, I think my favorite scene was the uh, sort of the running the gauntlet through the Weeping Angels. I, I would have enjoyed it more if it wasn't Weeping Angels. But that being that's... said, though, at least they didn't use them wrong. They didn't use them wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. I'm just kind of, oh, uh, God, it's the Weeping Angels again. Mm -hmm. Take them away, please. Oh, thank God, they're only At here least for one scene. At least Weeping Angels, it made sense that, you know, they're this ancient threat. It makes sense that at some point they wound up on Gallifrey and, you know, ended up trapped there. The Cybermen, on the other hand, what the fuck was the Cybermen doing on Gallifrey? Maybe it wandered in from the Death Zone. But why did it look like that model Cyberman? Yeah. Right. Yeah, why was it I, a I, Cybersman? I, I, I would have loved to seen it been an 80s Cyberman. Would have been better. Yes, an 80 Cyberman would have made sense. And have him do the hammy, cheesy voice. I don't know. Uh, is David Banks still alive? Last I checked. Get David Banks back in the suit and ha have him ham it well, up again. Well, if it were again. David Banks, it would have to be the leader. That would be fine. You get, yes. them, you get him in the old classic cyber leader thing and you have him look at the doctor and go, Eradicate me. Eradicate me. <laughs> that would have actually been fairly awesome and it would have been a great callback and just and reach out to the doctor eradicate me <laughs> alright Bill I had a scene picked the problem is or our discussion of Rassilon that does bring up the major red flag in that scene but ultimately I am going to say the scene where Rassilon tries to have the doctor executed and completely fails at it. It's the 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 lack the lack of presence from Rassilon does bring it down a bit, but otherwise I do think I really enjoyed yeah. that sequence a bit. Yeah, the Ra Rassilon does make it a fail. You know, Dalton would have just killed those guys in a in a hand gesture. Yeah. Fire. Fire or I'll fire at you. They you, shoot again and this just zaps them all in a row. Or he'd kill the closest one. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 there, there wasn't enough petty retaliation on Rassilon's part. Of course, they probably would have... Yeah, I think, I think they would have regenerated because I'm pretty sure his uh, guards no. would be all Time Lords. No, but... his gauntlet reduces them to dust. Not according to the question he was asking the doctor... Uh, shortly thereafter um no but based on what we saw in end of time yeah 
But I mean that that might have been someone on their final because I remember the, in, either in that episode. or or well, what happened with the master and Rassilon burned out half the power of the gauntlet. Possibly. Because here, you know, also... there, there, there's the him asking, how many regenerations did we give you? I've got all day, which says he uses up a certain amount of time per regeneration. Okay. So, Aaron, your favorite scene. I actually really kind of like the scene with uh, the doctor confronting me. On the end of time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it... In uh, the woman, uh, the woman who lived, she came off as kind of arrogant. Here, it's actually kind of, she is still a little bit arrogant, but she's also there's also a sadness to her, so it kind of makes mm -hmm. it helps sympathize with her a lot, a little bit more. I, 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 that I, I, that I was think... part of the point in the woman who lived was that living on her own, she had become this arrogant. You know, I'm the immortal and I'm better than everyone, and it kind of mm -hmm. took you know dealing with some of the situations the doctor faces. To kind of mellow her out and you know fix that and i think she's kind of gone well the doctor himself's a bit arrogant mm -hmm. let's True. face it but i think she's kind of at, at that point she is so old she has gone beyond that i mean you think about it we used to think that captain jack was the oldest living thing in the universe not anymore <laughs> I think uh, Schiller has him beat now by about fifteen billion years. Well, did did we determine how many how many? What year was uh, Utopia set in again? I thought that was one trillion hmm. years in the future. Oh, okay. So, yeah, then that would be quite a bit. I didn't think the universe was expected to survive that long, but yeah, Doctor Who writing. <laughs> hey, it's got a chart back of invoitment to another universe. It balances itself out. Anyway. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. So uh, of my favorite scenes, none of them were picked. Um, I'm going to name two of them. One, the introduction to the uh the classic TARDIS. Mm. Because that is like oh my god, that set looks so good. I was impressed by how good that set looked. Yeah, and I saw pictures afterwards of the old tire set, too, and I noticed immediately there were some very familiar things in the new version. Yeah, yeah it looked unbelievably good. I mean, mm -hmm. seriously, if they got rid of the current TARDIS set and went back to that classic TARDIS look, I would be happy with it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at that and going, my God, that looks, that is decent even in today's, you know, everything, it looks classic, clean, and good. Um, oh, I, there's I our director. I'm sorry, I just found a picture inside the class, in the inside of the classic TARDIS with the director talking to uh, the doctor and. Uh, mm. Um. Talking to them. I, I, I do wish they would go with more of a fourth Doctor era-ish internal uh, time rotor so there was a little more color in it. But other than that, it looked unbelievably good. Um, my other favorite scene was the finale where the Doctor gets the uh, sonic mm. screwdriver, or as I refer to it, the new hotness. <laughs> I saw that thing, I went, I want it! I saw that and went, ooh! Yeah, that's a nice one. Um, I actually uh, have a... Uh, uh, if I didn't accidentally close the link. A picture of the production photo um, for it. Um, and you can tell there's a lot of differences. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's been some noticeable changes. How many vibration settings does it have? <clears throat> That's probably why they changed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Capaldi did say, at least uh, as of when they filmed the BTS specials, after the fact that he didn't know all the settings on it. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you could tell that, and then um, you can take a look at the... Uh, Modified one, and there's not 
and you know they can't say that they're not going to have a completely new one by next season that you know looks closer to the production here's the picture of him holding it mm. from the episode mostly it's the red highlights that are missing but still um and some of the gear workings um Which still is fine by me yeah the gear workings were a bit much but i i think the yeah. red highlights were kind of nice hmm Still, that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I only wish um, that the uh, screwdriver stuff actually went bot uh, center to out instead of going around in a circle. Making it actually look like it's emitting something would have been kind of cool. But that's just my own personal nitpicks. Anyway. What's going in a circle would make it a little more like a screwdriver. Not not in a, well depends on how you're looking at it as a screwdriver or as a sonic device or as a sonic device yeah um okay uh things you didn't like matt oh here i'm expecting mine to get taken but i will see uh you, you mean the scene that we didn't like yes yeah, scene that um, you didn't like <laughs> least favorite scene um that Woman from Karn yelling at the doctor. I don't know why she got so overly involved. Her involvement did seem a little out of place. That actually should have been a general nitpick I actually had. Yeah. Um, Karn and Gallifrey have been uneasy allies for a long time. Um, the fact that she showed up and snarked was okay, but her to get yeah so directly involved in it. Seemed a little out of place. Her to get so directly involved in it that she's literally yelling at the doctor when she started off saying, I'm here to see the fireworks. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because well, she was here's expecting your fireworks, him to... fireworks, lady. She was expecting him to, you know, like, blow up the Capitol, not... I know, no, she wasn't, expect she wasn't expecting him to blow up the Capitol. She was expecting him to take out Rassilon mm -hmm. and the High Council, which he yeah. did within the first 15 minutes of the episode. Well, they did say he would stand in the ruins of Gallifrey. Whoa. It's him taking Clara and trying to escape, um, which you know, which they have mentioned will directly, you know, threaten time. That's I think what got her pissed. Okay, so um, Tim, your least favorite scene. Hmm. Probably. Uh. My least favorite scene is now that I'm being serious. Uh, that scene with that uh, guy. <laughs> <laughs> the scene with the Guys. guy on the desert. What a bunch of and rubbish. Desert. Yeah, he was mm -hmm. a little. He was a little bit. Um, bland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was well, like they. That's like they pulled somebody off a street somewhere and said, "Here, act like this America that's saying hi to the that's been informed by the doctor because he he had he doesn't really have acting talent." Mm-hmm. Okay, um, Bill. I'm going to go with the scene where the doctor shoots the general. Because that was that... mine. I knew it would be taken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This, despite being pressed to his limit, that just is completely out of character. It for is him. so out of character, especially considering that that's the president. You know, the, the president's personal guard, Stazer. He has no idea if that is going to completely block regenerations. It or, should. You know, it should absolutely. It should. It I think should. I bitched about that while I was watching the episode. Gallifrey I think in our and Stazer chat. suspend the regeneration process. They're supposed to yeah. be lethal. Because they're made to shoot Time Lords with. Furthermore, the Doctor's flippant thing of regeneration being considered man flu, um, I seriously had issues with considering how Tenet himself was looking at regeneration. You know? Yeah, even... but the, I mean, I, 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 I can kind of put that to the Doctor just having an overall negative view of, P, of Time Lords on Gallifrey. Mm -hmm. He's kind of biased against his culture that way, so I can kind of see him making that kind of remark in that light. But, but that doesn't actually, mean that he would just walk up to someone and shoot them with a staser. Yeah, that was just kind of... That was... And, I mean, they tried to soften the effect by, you know, 
having the character relieved, regenerating back into a female and being back to normal, that didn't really help that much. I'm sorry, Steven, it didn't. Yeah, no. that that was a one-off line, and the fact that it was written by someone who doesn't know how to write a female character... That's not, that's not why at all. I mean, he wrote it to soften the fact that the doctor just stasered a person. Oh, yeah, that that, that had, did not have that effect at all. Mm-hmm. No. No. No, it, I'm funny. sorry. It's, I, it, it's just so unlike the doctor, even in that level of desperation. You know, because the doctor's rule is like the Batman, you know? He does not kill. And, yes, he's, well, he'll regenerate, he'll be fine, still... You have the tenth. You have a few seasons ago the tenth Doctor waxing poetic about even if you regenerate, it's like being dead. Some new person saunters off with your with your name and you're gone. And you know, Steve, the tenth Doctor, the only person he was willing to hold a gun against was when he knew Rassilon was coming. Yes. Mm-hmm. The only time the sixth Doctor ever carried a gun was fighting off Cybermen amidst their own. Uh, um, Cyber Cybermen doesn't count. Yeah, because as far as the doctor's concerned, they're already dead. They're a zombie. Yeah, they're a they're, they're essentially a mechanical zombie. Yes, getting rid of. Yeah, and uh, Daleks have <laughs> have have a special position. Yes, uh, Daleks also have a special allowance for weaponry being used to back against them because holy smokes. But really, I mean, that's about the limit of. It. Yeah. So, Aaron, how about you? What's your least favorite? Um, I think most people have hit, a, hit on what I didn't really like for most of the episode, except for the part that, um, it's not a scene that I didn't like, it's a scene that I wish I had seen, um, uh, and that's Clara talking to the doctor as he's trying to get down into the, um, the hole there. Whatever she told the doctor yeah, that Yeah, and it like it like zooms out and like you're looking at the the skyscrapers and the overview of the city and everything. And it's just like, well, oh. it sounded like it was supposed to be something important. Oh, I we hope we, they we hit on it later. They did. They did. Yeah, it was what was written in the TARDIS in the final scene. I can't remember because we only got to see that once. Yeah, unfortunately, because of the long time, our uh, DVR actually cut it. Right oh. about the point that the diner was going to disappear, we saw it the first time live in its completeness. Mm -hmm. Oh, we went, so, wait, so wait, you wait, forgot what the, she wrote, wrote it in the chalkboard? You mean? Yes. The chalk chalkboard always uh, said, "Run, you clever boy, and be a doctor." Yeah. Yeah. That's essentially what she told him. Oh, okay. And also, of course, the and remember, their attention is going to be on me. Mm -hmm. That's basically what she told him, and it was the holdover until we got to see it. It was Clara being Clara for one last time, so to so to speak. Anyway, that's about it, because um, mine was Bill's the the whole shooting of the general. It's really the only scene that actually makes me teeth grindy. <sighs> I'm gray area on it. Me too. So I mean, I mean, I don't care for it too much, but at the same time, um, it's a co it's a huge group of corrupt time lords. Who's to say how many stacks of generations he has on them? Um, her. Ge generally speaking, uh, the Doctor is the only known person to have gotten a whole new life cycle except for maybe the Master being reincarnated to fight in the war and promptly running away, and Rassilon. Um, we don't know what else happened in the Time War that would have gotten this, but they normally don't... Uh, granting, apparently granting extra lives is supposed to be a huge, colossal thing. Although, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big thing, but it's something that they were willing to do with the Master in the Fifth Doctor era, so it's possible that... Actually, they weren't. They were just claiming they were. Oh, did, did, did they actually come out and say that? Um, it pretty sure. much, it, it was pretty much um, Barusa implied it. It was just a ploy to get him into to fight. He didn't gotcha. say that they didn't have the ability. It was more along the lines... So they, they weren't were using, actually planning to go through with it. No, they were they were hoping he'd die in the death zone, really. Mm-hmm. 
because after all, um, he wasn't, Barusa really wasn't expecting anyone to live through the death zone. He was expecting the doctor to get, get just through long enough to, uh, um, signal himself. And then he was going to come in mind control and kill the doctor and take immortality for himself because Barusa was a fucking asshole at that point. Um, which does seem to be an ongoing theme about Lord Presidents, just saying. Um, anyway, it is now uh, 15 minutes before we end the podcast, so it is time for our final thoughts. Um, starting with you, Matt. All right. There's a few nitpicky scenes, a few meh scenes, but I guess overall, in general, the story is pretty solid. It's a very... Uh, complex and rightly so for a big season finale. I think it's actually, actually arguably one of the better finales Moffat has ever written. So that's at least saying something. Um, pretty good effects. Some interesting new ideas. Hopefully they can flesh out a few more things in the next upcoming seasons. But we'll have to see. All right, Tim. Uh, I'd have to say that, uh, for what we got, it was very well done. Uh, uh, like I said, I, I liked the framing device and the performances by the actors. I myself was hoping for a bit more of an epic thing, well, what with the return to Gallifrey and all. But, uh, other than that, uh, it's okay. All right. Bill? I seem to be on the general uh, thing here in that uh, there were some issues with the episode, but really had to, you know, search and f find out a bit, whereas positive things were pr pretty easy to come up with. Generally, a pretty enjoyable episode with some minor drawbacks altogether fitting into the season. All right. Aaron. Um, I kind of enjoyed the kind of... <clears throat> going a little bit deeper into Gallifrey and uh, lore. Um, but I do kind of agree with Tim. I was hoping for something a little bit more epic on, on the uh, the same type of feel that uh, Death in Heaven Dark Water gave when we watched that, when it was kind of the world in peril. Uh, this was a little bit more of a quieter ending to the season, and it was actually a very open ending, um, which I'm not quite sure if I care for that. All right, but otherwise, I, I thought it was a it was a pretty good episode. All right, um, yeah, there's definitely more good than bad in this episode. Like the others, I don't think it reaches up to the epic level that um, Dark Water, Death in Heaven did as a finale. Um, but it still goes. It's still um, at least up there with that and the Pandorica opens um, in um, the listing of uh, season finales. Um, it definitely beats the season, the Series 6 and the Series 7 finales, which actually left a sour taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, more good than bad. Um, acting was good. Uh, the writing had a few holes in it, but nothing that was really teeth grindy except for the stasering of the general is the only thing that makes me grind my gears um so yeah that's actually a, a decent ending to what's been probably one of the best doctor who series we've had thus far and now the scoring gentlemen and lady thank you <laughs> don't forget that aspect please Matt. All right. Very good episode. Slightly flawed. Um, but only through nitpicks and hodgepodging. Um, I guess, yeah, it could have been a little more grandiose, but given what we've got and, and the Cliff Notes end of a season, about four. Four flat. All right. All right, uh, Tim. I'm also going to give it a four flat. Four on the floor from Tim. Yeah. Bill. 
Maybe the high one this week. I'm thinking a uh, 4.5. Hmm. 4.5 from Bill. We'll see. Aaron. Mm, I think I'm going to go with the 4 flat. 4 flat from Aaron. And I will be with Bill on this one and give it a 4.5. Which gives it a average score of 4.2. Not the highest we've had this season. The highest this season goes for the Zygon inversion. Um, bottom, the cellar dweller, of course, is sleep no more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Actually, the highest we had was the uh, Magician's Apprentice, the Witch's Familiar. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I missed that. It's only a one-point difference. I, I actually saw that as a 4-5. My bad. Ah. And it puts this and episode... Of course, that one was just tipped over uh, Zygon by Matt. They both had a 4-5 from everyone else, but Matt gave uh, da- Daleks that 5. I still stand by that 5. That was a darn good opening to a season. Mm-hmm. All right. Um... And that, by the way, at a 4.2, puts uh, Hellbent at number 33 on our list, currently standing with 129 episodes reviewed. Or I should say 129 stories. Um, It puts it just, it puts it on par with Frontier in Space. Destiny of the Daleks. Um, and just below The Last Christmas, Silence of the Library, Forest of the Dead. And above um, Bad Wolf, Parting of the Ways, The Mind Robber, and The War Games. And Legopolis. Plenty of good stuff around it, so. Yeah, it's 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 in the it's definitely in the good territory. And that's the way it was on December 9th, 2015. Yes. Yes. I know this is not what you were going for, but when you say the date that way, the Daily Show theme plays in my head. No, I was going for, um, oh, I can't remember. I think it was uh, Charles Kuralt. I'm sorry. For me, it's slowly evolving into Deckard Kane. Stay a while and listen. No, I was trying to do one of the old uh, news guys from the 80s. My bad. And that's the way it was. Yeah, I can't remember who was that. Who it was that did that. Wasn't that Walter Cronkite? Might have been Cronkite. Thank you. I could not remember his name. All right. Um, so I think that about wraps us up for today. Uh, If you enjoy listening to us, please uh, like our videos on YouTube and subscribe on Twitch.tv, YouTube.com, and Mixcloud.com, or on the uh, the various apps. You can also uh, like and follow for news and updates on Facebook and Twitter. Or if you want to support us, you can head on over to Patreon.com slash UnearthlyPodcast. Once finals are over, I do promise to do something to update those uh, ones that have not been updated in as often as often as they should have been. And of course, don't forget to join us next week. Uh, I think we can tell everyone what we're reviewing next week, right? I think so. So uh, we're, we're, we will be. We're all on board. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, if uh, you remember, uh, an unearthly podcast has uh, up up until recently been up to date with all uh, regeneration stories. Uh, however, there was a new one released this year that we weren't able to review that week. So uh, they're taking a look at that next week in uh, the, in the Sixth Doctor, the Last Adventure by the team at Big Finish Productions. Woo. See you uh, then. By the way, mm-hmm. um, I just want to add one thing. I actually think it, that this might not be as epic because it's just two weeks from Christmas. So, yeah, because it's going to be, we're doing that next week. Mm-hmm. And then we're uh, going, uh, we're not going to have a Wednesday, I believe, next week. We're going to the 25th. Right. It's uh, Friday, I think. Yep. We're going to wait till Friday and cover the Christmas special um, as it, right after it airs. Like, probably half an hour after uh the uh, episode ends, we're going to be podcasting. 
Uh, we'll have more details next week. Oh, yes, when I'm, we actually, actually... I'm off of work that day. I actually had to think about it for a second because Saturday, <laughs> Saturday, Saturday nights I always watch the episode after the internet is already a flutter about it. Yeah, well, this is this is Christmas Day. Christmas Day, I am off of work. So um, we will be uh, probably coming to you next week with more information when we do have confirmation from BBC America when it's airing. Mm -hmm. So we'll know exactly when we're podcasting. We're all watching it legally on BBC America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, I watch it legally. <laughs>